So this week we are going to go on to um, lesson seven. So now we're going to basically talk about um, common distributions that we see. So we've been talking a lot about variables and what we do with them, uh, but this week we're going to talk more about what happens when we want to present them um, graphically or like in a visual manner. So we'll talk about basically how that works. All right, so when we have normal distributions, um, remember we've been talking about normal distributions a lot lately, um, but we want to make sure we specify basically what it means to have a normal distribution. Um, so in this case, if we're looking at this curve, remember when we were talking about Z curves, uh, that we would always have a normal curve that would have this um, mean of zero. So remember this is our mean, and then our standard deviation of one, okay? So this is just um, another visual what we talk about. And here you can see examples, um, the darkened lines here that we have. Those are just examples of a z-score. Um, remember, so when we get a z-score, be a point on this x-axis here. Um, and that's what's going to give you your uh, z-score. So that's just a little bit of a review um, for that. But, um, but yeah, so and then you'll also see um, normal distributions written with this notation here. Um, so when it says n and then in the parentheses, we, um, n just means that we have a normal distribution. It's kind of telling you that, you know, if you don't have a picture and you can't tell. Um, and then it just has your uh, mean, comma, your um, standard deviation. So um, down here, this is basically the notation for this curve over here because we're saying it's normal, has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. And then keep in mind, um, per the empirical rule, we do have um, the total area under our curve is 100%. That's why we're able to break it up dependent on those Z curves or those Z scores. Um, you know, if it's plus or minus one, remember 68%, 95%, 99.7% for three. And then, you know, anywhere past that's going to be most of the curve. And then obviously um, the farthest out is going to be the entire curve. So 100%. Um, and then just remember Z scores are going to be um, when we take our um, mean minus our um, observed value divided by our standard deviation. So um, that's how we get our Z score because remember, so that would be like how we got this point down here. Um, we figured out, you know, what our um, mean actually was minus whatever um, value that we saw. I don't know what just happened there. My brain went. Um, whatever uh, like value that we saw here um, and observation and then we're going to divide that by our standard deviation so that's how we find a z-score it's a little bit of a review but um, it is important to keep in mind just so that you have a good grasp on what a normal curve is what it looks like um, and you know how we're able to translate this to other variables when we have them okay my computer's being weird la, la, la. all right Let's keep grooving. All right, so when we are using normal distributions, once again, remember we talked about confidence intervals, but it does come into play here, so we're gonna keep keep talking about it. So, wow, I put a lot of exclamation points here. I must have been excited. Um, so when we have our normal distribution, this is where we talk about um, the confidence intervals are based upon that. Um, so basically the main idea there is that when you're making a confidence interval, remember it's always gonna go off of, um, those two point whoa, those two points, your lower and your upper bound. Um, so in order to have that, we have to make sure that we are um, having a normal distribution before we do our confidence interval. Same thing with um, using our um, empirical rule. We do also have to have a normal distribution in order for that to work and make sense. Um, so yeah, and then so remember this is. I won't harp on this too much. You guys are probably like, that's enough confidence intervals we get it but uh, we do need to understand it in order you know um, to move on talk about real sample proportion central limit theorem and whatnot so I uh, remember we have our point estimate which is going to be our p hat um, for proportions sample proportions or x bar for our um, means or sample means so we'll have our point estimate plus or minus our z star um, so your test statistic and then times your standard error so that's why it's important that we do know you know, we've been talking about two often 1.96 or two for our 95% confidence intervals, but um, as we move forward, it is important that you understand how to find that Z-score um, because we aren't always gonna be doing 95% confidence intervals. So you wanna be able to know how to find that multiplier, which will be your test statistic. Um, 
So that's why we reviewed how to find a z-score because that's how you're able to find it. So remember, you have your sample statistic minus your null parameter. Um, so this is going to remember parameters go with populations. And then, um, and then you're divided by your standard error. So that's how you'd be able to find your um, test statistic, z -star, your z star, super fun. Um, so yeah, and in terms of your standard error, you know, we've kind of just been talking about it um, in general, but we do want to recognize that our standard error um, basically comes from either a rule of sample proportions, if we're talking about um, proportions, obviously, and central limit theorem is what we use for means. So that's how we find our standard error, which is, um, so that's important too. So basically, the main thing that we're starting to get at, you know, we, we were talking about confidence intervals in general before and just kind of what they are um, and kind of how to find them. But now we're kind of getting more um, into the concept of like how to find each particular part. Because often, you know, you'd be given the standard error, you'd be given that Z star. Um, but here we're getting more conceptual as to what that Z star is, how to find it. And then also your standard error, what the standard error is. Um, in relation to these two different um, rules, and then also um, how we're able to calculate it. So just a little more work because we love work. So, okay, central limit theorem. So we were talking generally before that we wanna make sure we have a large enough sample size and you know, so we're being very general about the whole thing, um, but we wanna keep in mind that actually um, there is specific, we can be more objective about this. So remember when we were talking about um, uh, outliers and you know we kind of be like oh you know you can see if it looks like an outlier but then we were like okay no you can use the IQR method it's a more objective way this is kind of the same idea you know we were talking about you know oh we have to have a big enough sample size to um, estimate using a normal distribution but here it's going to go a little more um, objectively and specifically about um, how we do that so Often, um, so we have central limit theorem with a large enough sample size, the distribution of sample means has to be approximately normally distributed. Well, it will be approximately nor normally distributed. So if you think about um, on stat key, uh, when you keep taking like thousands and thousands of samples, it always kind of comes out to be some sort of normal curve because um, you're going to have hopefully most of them surrounding your mean. Those are going to be like, like the highest values. That's why the um, middle of it is so high. And then it kind of dips down and um, you have lower values out here because these aren't as common, so their frequency is going to be lower and the more common ones are going to be higher. That's what makes it that beautiful normal distribution there. So central limit theorem is basically saying that if you're talking about sample means, so remember this goes with means, um, make sure you deviate between the two. We're not talking about proportions right now. So um, if you have your central limit theorem and you have a large enough sample size, often we use 30, um, but that's, that's just another rule that um, we often talk about but um so but yeah so if we have that large enough sample size um which we always want that big sample size that means that our we can assume that our distribution is going to be approximately normal so i always think about in stat key when you keep taking all those samples over and over and over again and then your um, distribution always looks approximately normal so that's um and that's saying regardless of the shape of the population so it's basically saying if you have a skewed pop population, but you keep taking samples from it, it's going to be approximately normal um, if you take a bunch of samples. So that's where that comes from. Um, okay, so talking a little bit more about different types of variables. Um, so, you know, we were talking about just variables in general um, before, but now we're going to get more into um, specific types of variables that um, kind of have different types of values attached to them. So um, this is a discrete random variable. So remember, um, in this case, this is going to be a um, quantitative variable, again, because remember discrete and continuous were our two types of quantitative variables, so those that involve values and numbers. Um, so it's going to be a discrete random variable. That means that it can only take on a set number of values. And um, it's going to be counting like how often an event occurs but then um, one thing to keep in mind, and we'll talk about this with the conditions, it does have to have a fixed number of trials. So you can't, um, like you know, on Stacky, how you can keep clicking it and whatever, you, you would have to stop at some point and have that set um, you know, ceiling to say, this is um, the amount of trials that we're taking. It's not infinite trials like we can do with other variables. Um, so yeah, so there's three conditions that must be met in order um, for it to be a binomial random variable. So first, um, like we just talked about, we have to have a fixed number of trials. 
also known as a fixed sample size, so n has to equal something. So n is the same thing as your number of trials. We'll see that in a few equations um, further on. Um, and then the probability of su a success is the same on each trial. So this is basically saying that when you do a trial, at the probability, if you're, let's say you're picking marbles out of a hat or something, and the probability of getting a red one is 0.2. When you do the next um, sample, the probability of getting a red one also has to be 0.2. It can't change. Um, you know, if you're just taking random variables in general, it could change, you know, dependent on uh, what your sample is, because you usually make them all random. But in this case, we have to have the probability of a success being the same on each trial um, in order for it to be a binomial random variable. And then lastly, um, the trials have to be independent of each other, um, which kind of makes sense because if they were dependent on each other, the probability of successes would probably change. Um, but if they're independent of each other, um, you, should, you would be able to control for making sure that probability is the same for each one on each trial. That's a set number of trials. Um, so for an, for an example, you could say um, that we have 30 trials of something, I can't think of something right now, but we'll say we have uh, 30 trials of something and the probability of getting what you want is going to be 0.2 on each trial and they're independent of each other. So that's a way that you can write out a binomial random variable there. Um, so yeah, keep in mind they have to be independent of each other, cannot affect each other in any way, um, or we aren't able to consider it a binomial random variable. Um, okay. Okay, so um, this, <laughs> this equation is super fun and crazy, um, but I'm pretty sure that you, you, you'll never have to do this by hand. Um, but this, like I said, I've showed you, um, I show you a lot of things that you may not have to do like for an exam or something, but it's important to understand conceptually what's going on. Cause obviously you can plug things into the, um, mini tab or whatever and you know it'll shoot out an answer for you which is great but um if you don't conceptually understand it it's going to be harder um to move forward you know in the course and um make sure that you get because if you don't get these basic concepts then you're not able to move forward you know because you can know how to do the z-score equation you know do your x minus x bar and then um, divided by your standard deviation, like you can do that. You guys are able to do that. But if you don't understand like what that x, um, what that z-score is on a normal curve, then it's going to be kind of tough to you know be able to standardize it and that kind of thing. So the reason why I'm showing you this and reviewing it is because you just kind of want to understand what we're doing um, when we're trying to find our um, the probability of a binomial random variable. So. Remember when we have P and then in parentheses something, it's talking about our probability of something. So here we have, um, and you know, at the bottom we can, you see all of the different um, variables we have in here. So this is saying, this, the right side or the left side of the equation is saying probability of X equals and then K. So probability basically that, um, that we get that many numbers of successes. Um, so, so yeah, we're trying to see the probability of x equals k, and then this is how we do it. So, um, this right here is called a combination. This is basically how you would, um, so for example, if you had like three combination five, um, we would go ahead and have, um, you would make this go three times two times one. It's basically like this little exclamation point thing. Um, then you'd have five times four times three times two times one. Um, so that's basically what that is. Um, if you're confused, it's not, it's not a, um, a fraction. It's not n divided by k. You want to make sure that you're doing that um, factorial there. Um, yes. Yes, Jimmy, factorials. Last semester, I remember I was talking about this, and I, I couldn't think of the word, and I was just so sad. So I was kind of proud that I kind of thought, but yes, Jimmy, you got me, A plus. Um, but yeah, like I said, you'll never necessarily have to do this by hand, but um, oh, this is a guess. <laughs> well, you guessed correctly, that's good. That means you're a good guesser. I am not. Whenever I guess, I'm usually wrong. So it's a good skill to have. Um, but so yeah, that's all this is saying. Um, our P is going to be the probability um, 
that it occurs in one trial. So remember, this has to be the same every time. That's why we're able to put this in this equation because um, it's not going to change. So that probability is always going to be the same. Number of successes, uh, we just use that in our exponents there. Um, so yeah, just overall, what the like when you're we're computing this, basically we're finding probability of a certain amount of successes that we have in n trials. So remember, um, we're going to have a fixed number of trials. And when we're trying to compute this, um, we're trying to find out what's the probability that we get this many successes in all the trials that we're doing. So I can say, um, you know, the probability that we get six, exactly six successes in 40 trials, that would be how I'm finding this binomial random variable um, probability here. So just a little conceptual stuff. So super fun. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, finding our um, mean standard deviation uh, for binomial random variables. So we're still talking about those. And remember, it has to have the three. Um, it has to meet those three conditions. So um, when we're computing the mean and the standard deviation, remember, um, like I said, you can obviously do these and you know just plug it in. But I understand what we're doing. So our mean of the variable, we're going to have n times p. So this makes sense because we're taking our, our sample size and then multiplying it by the probability of successes, which is going to be the center because we're trying to figure out what's the probability of getting these successes um, out of this entire number of trials. So depending on the number of trials and the probability, that's going to change, obviously. So and if you think about it, if um, let's say your probability is 0.3 and then um, your n is 1, then your probability is going to be or your mean is going to be 0.3. But if we increase our sample size to n equals 100, then times 0.3, then that's going to get um, that's going to change. So you see how if you have a larger sample size, your mean's going to um, change there. So um, that's just another way to understand, you know, how larger sample sizes are always, um, you know, better to work with. And also, um, it's also known as e ex, which is our expected value. So that's saying um, what do we expect to get, which is our our middle, um, because remember, if we have our mean, that's going to be the most um, frequently occurring one because it's the highest point on the um, on the distribution. So it's saying it's our expected value because most of the value showed up here at the mean. So that's the one that we expect to happen. Um, so yeah, and then our uh, standard deviation of the binomial random variable. All this is just taking your sample size and your probability, and then um, you're trying to find that to figure out on what that uh, standard deviation would be. And then you'd be able to plot this on a normal curve, obviously, similar to what we've been doing, just um, using specifically binomial random variables here. Oh, review questions. Raise the roof. OK, so let's try these out. Um, all right, so I gave you a table here. So this is the probability of x equals x. So remember, if I. Some people, this will confuse people other semesters, that um, these are my x's here, like in this top row. So these are all x. So we're saying the probability that our number of successes is whatever this x is. So this is like the probability that x equals 0, probability that x equals 1, so on and so forth. Um, so go ahead and try to compute probability of x is less than 3. Oh, this looks like a heart that you would do in middle school, like less than 3. Aww. Okay, so go ahead and calculate this and let me know what you think and we'll go over it then.
Yay. Okay, great job, guys. Um, other semester people really struggled with this one, so I'm glad you guys are um, understanding this. So basically, what we look at here, so we have probability of x is less than 3. So if we look at this table, everything that's less than 3 is going to be right here. So from this point and then to the left, less than 3. So it would be 2, 1, and 0. It's not less than or equal to 3 because technically that would be everything. Um, because remember, this all has to be equal to 1. Um, so yeah, so we just want to go ahead and take, um, add these together. And if we add these together, we do get 0 0.59. Um, so that is our total situation there. So that's a probability that x is less than 3. Um, so these are for binomial random variables. Remember when you see this um, type of probability, that's what it is. So it's a probability that x is less than 3, which is going to be the probability of 0 plus a probability of 1 plus a probability of 2, so 0.59. Yay, great job, guys. All right, let's do another one. Oh, okay. According to a 2001 study of college students by Harvard University School of Public Health, 19.3 of those included in the study abstain from drinking from USA Today, April 3rd, 2002. Suppose that all of current college students in the United States, 20% um, abstain from drinking. A random sample of four college students is selected with the following binomial results. So our n is four, because our sample size is four. And then our probability on the trials is going to be 0.2. Um, so from the table above, what is the probability that exactly two college students in the sample abstain from drinking? So this one might be a little simple for you guys, but just so you understand the concept is. So let me know what you think about this one. Yay! Thank you for the participation, Hannah. I feel like I'm here alone sometimes. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, there's a pen. Okay, yeah, so great job. So remember, um, over here on this left side here, these are um, our x's. So uh, the probabilities next to them is the probability that x equals whatever it is. So this one is literally saying from the table was probability that exactly two college students, so that's going to be equal to. So technically, it would be probability of x equals 2. We're trying to figure that out. And in this case, it's going to be 0 0.1. Oh, <laughs> it's OK. Um, 0 0.1536. That's going to be our answer because, yeah, right here, it's just going to be a probability that exactly 2. So we're not really looking at the rest of them. So yeah. Yay, good job. All right. So let's do a few more. Okay, so for a given binomial random variable, n equals 12 and p equals 0.6. So compute the mean and standard deviation of this.
Yes. Woo. Good job, guys. Absolutely. So all we're doing here is using our equation. So remember, our mean is equal to our sample size times our probability. And then, so remember, basically both, both of these need to be fixed. Um, this is going to be the same on each trial, and this is going to be a fixed sample size because it's a binomial random variable. And then our um, standard deviation equation is square root of p times 1. I don't know this one. Maybe it's oh, n p times 1 minus p. Okay, so, so yeah, so then so our mean is going to be um, 12 times 0 0.6, which comes out to be 7.2. And then standard deviation, square root of 12 times 0 0.6 times 1 minus 0 0.6, um, whoa, which equals 1.697. You guys are geniuses. Hallelujah. And just to conceptualize this a little bit, oh, um, that was going to be such a nice normal curve. Okay, so remember, basically what we got here is our mean standard deviation. So if I were to write this on a graph, I would basically have 7.2 here. And then if I was talking about one standard deviation away, so this is going to be one standard deviation, and this is going to be equal to 1.697. So that's if we were to conceptualize it and basically realize that um, this, is what, this is what we're finding, our mean and standard deviation, um, which is on this beautiful graph here. So yes, you guys did a great job. Super proud. All righty. Okay, one more. So um, SAT math scores have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100 imply the empirical rule, because I love it so much, and find the range of the middle 95% of SAT math scores. Let me know what you think about this one. Woohoo! Perfect! 
Hannah even did an interpretation for us. Well, that was just beautiful. Okay, so let's look at this. So remember, our empirical rule told us, if you recall, that 95% of our data lies between plus or minus two standard deviations of mean. So remember, if our mean is going to be zero here, um, we're going to have 95% of our data here. Okay, so if we were to go ahead and apply the same rule to the data that we have here, I'm going to go ahead and let me use a different color. I like colors. So I want to go ahead and first draw my mean here. So this will be 500. And then I'm going to find um, my standard deviation two away. So one away is going to be, um, so this is 100. Um, so this is going to be 400. And then two away is going to be another 100. So that's going to be 300. Um, so yeah, total this is going to be, so this is two standard deviations. Um, and then if I do the same thing the other way, one standard deviation is going to be 100 up here, so this is going to be 600. And then if I go up one more standard deviation at another 100, we are going to get 700. So basically what I found here is that these so 300 and 700 are the two numbers, the lower and upper bound, that um, correspond with 95% of our data because it's plus or minus two standard deviations. So we can say we are 95% confident, whoop, that was interesting, confident that the um, mean population SAT math scores uh, is between, oops, is between, if, I promise my handwriting is better in person. I don't know what this is. Is between um, 300 and 700. And great job, Hannah, remembering that we are always um, making these conclusions about our population. So don't let that trip you up. That's an easy thing to get tripped up on um, when you have a multiple choice question and you see, you know, we are 95% confident that da 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 da. And it all sounds all exciting and correct, but you might dismiss that one key point that we want to make sure that it is going to be talking about population and not samples when we make our final conclusion. Um, remember, same thing with hypothesis tests. We always say that, um, you know, we're making this conclusion about the population. That's why we wrote our um, null and alternative hypotheses in terms of that. So yeah, all right, yay. You guys did a great job tonight, as per usual. Um, okay, yeah, so obviously check out the YouTube channel. Super exciting. Getting getting so many views and I just it, I'm gonna go viral and it's crazy, um, but yeah. So our next group review will be on Sunday at 10 o'clock for this same chapter, um, and yeah. If you haven't given me your email into the chat box, please go ahead and you, know, <laughs> you told your friends. I you know what? When my friends like found out that I was posting it. I shouldn't have told them because then they were like, oh, no way. And then they started, like, going on and making fun of me. So I was like, you know what? My students say it's helpful, so I don't need the sass. <laughs> but, yeah, if you, if you need a good laugh on a Friday night, go ahead. Put on one of my reviews and just <laughs> get a good laugh out of it. It's super, super hilarious, I know. But, um, but <laughs> no, yeah, seriously, I'm – I'm going to start turning into, I don't know, I'm going to be, they're going to have me on Good Morning America and be like, she started out as just a Penn State student. Now she's taking over the internet with her stat reviews. <laughs> but I appreciate you guys coming and um, participating. It definitely makes it much more fun than me talking to myself. So it'd be even worse. So I appreciate you guys coming. Um, but yeah, if you haven't given me your Penn State email, go ahead and type that in the chat box just for, um, uh, attendance purposes, I'll just used to track attendance or anything. Nothing, we're not going to email you or anything. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has any other questions, let me know. If not, you guys are good for tonight.